So uh, yeah, I'm from the Department of Nuclear Engineering, and um, I've been here at A&M for since 2006, so 14 years now. I, I really like it here. Um, and uh, my areas, I, I'm in nuclear engineering. My, my work is focusing on nuclear reactor safety and thermal hydraulics, two-phase flow. And um, so it's, uh, I'm looking at heat transfer, fluid flow, and more mechanical engineering type work for a nuclear application. And so I'd really like to share what, what I do here with you. But uh, first of all, for the main topic, I, I said that I'd talk about nuclear reactors, give you a little overview on how they work and how safe they are. And then we'll get into my research. Um, so nuclear energy provides about 20% of our electricity right now in the US. So it, it's a very important energy source for us. And um, let's see, I've got some chat here. I'll make sure I can. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, let's see. I'll see if I can keep the chat open. So we'll talk a little bit about what nuclear safety is. I'd really like to define that so you know where we're coming from. And then we'll show you how a nuclear power reactor works, some basic information, and then we'll dive deep into uh, nuclear power safety. What is it? How did it start? Where, we, where are we today? And I'd like to make the case to you that our nuclear reactors are very safe. And then I'll, I'll talk to you about my research. Okay, um, I am an experimentalist and I love to share uh, to show off my lab. And I can't do that these days, so I'm, I'm in person. So I'm really glad I could take a video and show that to you. Um, so what is nuclear safety? Okay. Nuclear safety is, we define it as in the unlikely event of a release of radioactive materials to the environment, there is reasonable assurance that actions can be taken to protect the population around nuclear power plants. Okay, so it's about keeping the public safe. We don't have releases of radioactivity very often at all that, that would pose a danger, and we that's that's our goal. Okay, um, so sources of radionuclides are we have a lot of radioactive material, of course, in the core and in some of in the the, the fueled region inside our nuclear reactor, and uh, we have some radioactive materials that. Uh, due to maintenance and basic upkeep of the uh, reactor. There are a number of places where they could be, but we work very hard to keep those that radioactivity contained so that it, it doesn't get out into the atmosphere. So uh, let's look at a, let's ground ourselves with this basic slide of a, a nuclear power, uh, an electric power cycle. This is not um, specific to nuclear. Basically, what we're doing is we're using nuclear heat to produce steam. And that this steam source could be nuclear fuel, it could be coal, natural gas, it could be a, a number of different sources. What you do is you produce your steam, you send it to a turbine, deliver the thermal energy from the steam to the mechanical energy of the turbine, and the turbine powers the generator that excites the generator that produces electricity. And then the steam that has expanded in the turbine is brought to a condenser where it, it's condensed into water and then we pump it back into the, our whatever our steam source is. Okay, for us, we're looking at the steam source being a nuclear reactor. We have two types of reactors. We have in the US, two types of commercial reactors. We have what's called a boiling water reactor where this cold water comes into our reactor pressure vessel and produces steam directly here. The steam comes right out from the reactor pressure vessel to the turbine. We have another type of um, reactor. It's called a pressurized water reactor or BWR. And in that case, the BWR, I'll show you a figure of it, but the, we have a steam generator here. It's just the second derivative. Okay. So I just mentioned this slide. We have two types of reactors, the boiling water reactors and the pressurized water reactor. I have a figure here of the pressurized water reactor. We about we have 90, about 98 or 99 operating commercial reactors right now. About two thirds of them are PWRs, pressurized water reactors. And they work where you have a, a pressure vessel 
with your fuel inside it. And the coolant, the water comes in, removes the fission heat from the fuel and flows in this circuit. It's a single phase water circuit. It delivers its energy to the secondary side of the steam generator. So we're generating our steam in the secondary loop. And then that goes to the loop I just showed you with the turbine and the turbines on the same shaft generator, you generate electricity and the steam is condensed in the shaft. So this is the Rankine cycle right here. Okay, with the boiling water reactor, we call it a direct cycle because the steam is generated inside the reactor pressure vessel. Water comes in, it removes the fission heat. The water is boiled inside the reactor pressure vessel, goes to the curve and comes back. Okay, so that's basically what a nuclear reactor is. Um, again, I, I'm gonna be talking about reactor safety and how we um, remove heat and keep the core adequately cooled and all that. I'm not gonna talk to you about neutrons today. Not, a, not much of a physics lecture here. Okay, so uh, with both BWRs and PWRs, they run on the vapor ranking cycle, steam cycle. And they're about 33% efficient. That's where our, the Rankine cycle is. That's not a nuclear limitation. It's a limitation of the, the steam cycle. And um, just to, I, I, you guys, I think some of you are engineers. So I figured you'd like a few numbers that are operating pressures for the PWR, where the fuel is, is well over 2,000 pounds. And for the BWR, it's a little over 1,000 pounds. We have metric numbers too. Um, and then the power rating, these reactors produce a lot of power. The PWRs can produce up to 1300 megawatts electric. That's a large plant. Okay, 1000 megawatts powers about 1000 homes. That's a rule of thumb. And the BWRs are generally over, the lar large ones are over 1000 megawatts electric. We have the, the newest one is, that's uh, design certified is up to 1500 megawatts electric. So these are big machines. We like to keep them up and running at full power and uh, producing electricity. We have two units at Comanche Peak, just southwest of Fort Worth. Those are PWRs. And we have two units in South Texas Project down in Bay City, a little bit, a couple hours southwest of Houston. And those are also PWRs. Okay, they produce a lot of our electricity in Texas. All right, let's look a little bit more what these things look like. In the next couple of figures, I'll show you some pictures of what a PWR looks like on the left side and a BWR on the right side. Okay, so pressurized water reactor, boiling water reactor. We're looking here at the pressure vessel. The reactor pressure vessel houses the nuclear fuel. So the nuclear fuel is in the lower part of the reactor. And what happens is the, the coolant, the water coolant, comes in and annulus flows down, flows up and removes the fission heat and it flows out. And this is a 2D picture, you could think in 3D. Uh, I wish I had three hours to talk to you right now, but I'm gonna go kind of fast here. With the boiling water, so this is all single phase water. With the boiling water reactor, you have your reactor pressure vessel that operates about a thousand PSI. Your, coolant, your fuel is sitting in the lower part of the vessel your water comes in, it flows in the downcomer, just like in the BW, PWR. It flows in the lower income, flows past the fuel. But the difference here is that the water, which is slightly subcooled, it comes to saturation and it boils within the reactor pressure vessel of the BWR. And then you have the wet steam coming out of the core region and it goes through some equipment to remove water droplets. And then you have steam going directly to the turbine from the BWR. You have hot water coming out of the PWR. Let's look a little bit more at this. So now you see with the PWR on the left, you have your nuclear fuel, nuclear fuel region, the core region. So it's a lot of thermal, uh, uh, we call them fuel assemblies made of fuel rods. And I'll show you in more details in just a moment. But you can see how the water comes in an annulus on both sides down, up and out, and then out to the um, steam generator. The boiling water reactor has more equipment inside it because it is the steam generator also. But the core region is this region right here that I'm showing, highlighting with my, my uh, cursor. And so the water comes in, flows through the bottom, up through the core, 
And then through some all this steam generation, steam generator equipment, the, this equipment removes the droplets, the water droplets from the steam, and then the steam goes up and out. There's a steam outlet nozzle right there. All right, and then looking, I'm looking down on top of the core now. Um, this is the core of a PWR. It's a cross section looking down on top of it. I kind of like this picture because it has some dimensions. So the core has an outer diameter of about 112 inches. That's not that big. It's pretty high power density. Um, and the reactor pressure vessel is this thick hatched region. It's between four and six inches thick of carbon steel because it operates at high pressure. The VWR core is a little bit harder to see. I don't have as good of a picture, but the fuel is in between these little crosses. And I'll show you the next picture is better. Okay, this is here. Now we're getting to the fuel. On the left, the PWR. This is what we call a fuel assembly. This one is a 17 by 17 array of fuel rods. And that's where the nuclear fuel is. It's inside these tubes, these fuel tubes. And so this assembly, if you went back a picture, each one of these squares represents one of the assemblies here. Okay, and with the boiling water reactor, we have fuel rods that are in, this is showing a, what is that? That's an eight by eight array of a, of a fuel assembly. This picture is showing four assemblies of VWR fuel rods. So the rods, the fuel, the nuclear fuel is inside these rods. The fission occurs inside these tubes. Right, so that's what a nuclear reactor looks like. And again, what we're doing is uh, the aim of nuclear safety is to prevent a release of radioactivity to the public or to at least protect the public in the event there is one. And uh, what has to happen is you have to have a, a breach of the fuel rods. Okay, so fuel gets fuel, uh, radioactive um, material could, would have to leave, somehow find a way out of the fuel rods and then get outside of the reactor pressure vessel. And we have many layers of protection to prevent this radioactivity release. Okay, so, you know, we really only have to do one thing to keep the core to, uh, for nuclear safety, and that is to always keep the fuel cool, to always remove heat from it. As long as the fuel is in a pool of water, it's cooled enough. It has to be below the water level. And if we can do that, we're safe. Okay, so how do we keep the core cooled? As I said, we always keep the nuclear fuel in contact with liquid water. If we do this, then we're removing heat from the fuel, we're keeping it cooled and the radioactivity cannot um, escape. Okay, well, so now I say that sounds easy, right? Well, not quite that easy. There, there's risk in, to anything and there's no guarantee of absolute safety. And so uh, we have had a few accidents. We've had three in large commercial reactors, um, but that's pretty good safety record. That's what I'd like to demonstrate to you. Okay, so what we do is our guiding principle is as low as reasonably achievable, meaning we keep our exposure to ra radioactivity as low as reasonably achievable. We aim for zero exposure, but we have some. This is where we started. I think a lot of you have heard of this. This is um, the very first, it was an experiment done in 1942. It's called Chicago Pile One. It was at the University of Chicago under the football field. This was um, in 1942, so part of the war effort in World War II. We had some very famous physicists, if you've heard of the name Enrico Fermi or Walter Zinn, who were working on this thing just demonstrated that we could have a, what we call a controlled, a self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction. We could have a nuclear fission reaction that continues on and on and on, it sustains itself. You have a fission, you produce a couple of neutrons, they fission, they produce a couple more neutrons, and on and on. Uh, so this was our first man-made reactor that demonstrated the physics that the physics were possible to have a sustained nuclear chain reaction. Our reactors don't look anything like this, but even this reactor had safety systems in it 
it had a mechanism to shut down the nuclear reaction if we needed to. And that was quite amazing because at this time, we didn't know if we could even have a, a sustaining nuclear reaction. These Fermi and, and company were out to demonstrate that the physics were uh, practical for having a, a chain reaction. Okay, so that's where we started. And I, I wanted to show you that picture to show you that we've had nuclear safety has been of concern from even our very first reactor. We consider nuclear safety in the design of the reactor when we license it. We have a nuclear regulatory commission, the NRC, that regulates us and they look over everything. Nuclear safety is considered in the construction, operation, maintenance, all the way out to we even have accident management and emergency response plans. So that if something were to happen, that we could respond to it and maintain nuclear reactor safety. If you guys are interested, there's a, a video, it's about five or six minutes long, and it, I, it, I think it's worth your time. It's put out by our professional society, the American Nuclear Society. Um, I've got the, the link here that talks with some of the a couple people who were involved with the with this experiment I showed you with with this one okay it was put out I think it was made about 10 years ago I don't remember exactly so that the people are getting pretty old but it's kind of amazing that we still have people around who are here at the very beginning of the nuclear industry so that's worth your time if you have it in the interest um so anyways history of nuclear safety Okay, our, our very first reactors considered nuclear safety. Our knowledge was limited at the time about fission reactions and radioactivity and how to shield from radiation and all. So they had very large, what we call safety margins built in. Okay, a lot of more shielding than we needed to, to contain the radioactivity, and more water than we needed to remove the heat. Um, it, so the first nuclear reactors, I'm gonna tell you, those were for the war effort. They were not for peaceful purposes. They were to produce plutonium for nuclear weapons. Um, that was the war effort. We're not involved in that at all um, here. In my research, what we teach our students here, um, we're here to, for, to develop nuclear power for peaceful purposes. And so shortly after the war, um, Admiral Rickover of the Navy say, hey, we're gonna start a nuclear Navy. We can use these machines for peaceful purposes. And now the, our Navy is 100% nuclear. All of the subs are powered by nuclear reactors and the aircraft carriers also. They're all running on nuclear power. Um, so the, shortly after the war, the nuclear Navy began and this concept of a containment, a building or a structure around the reactor to contain radioactivity uh, came about. And now we're required to have a containment for licensing in the US. Okay, that's a major part of our nuclear safety. Our experience shows we have a high level of, of nuclear safety, even from the very first generation of nuclear power plants. And we keep raising the bar. The safety levels have been successfully raised for new plants. We have numerical ways of expressing this safety level and we keep raising the bar. Um, not that we think our current reactors are unsafe, but we can always do better. Um, so we've done a lot of testing to understand the basic phenomenon and, uh, and uh, we have a good basis for um, verification of our analysis models. We have reactor safety codes that have been validated against this data. Okay, so recent improvements to light water reactor safety. Oh, I didn't mention our reactors are light water reactors. They use the, the regular water that you we deal with every day. There's also heavy water that has deuterium, D2O, instead of H2O. We use light water. Um, and uh, so uh, we continue to elevate the level of safety in light water reactors. Um, the recent improvements are incremental because we've already made the bigger, easier improvements. Okay. And um, we're also working on uh, non-light water reactors, which are gas-cooled reactors. And we also have, instead of building only large reactors, now we have designs for small modular reactors, which are reactors that have a smaller output. They'd be good for a smaller market than, say, Texas. And we have micro-reactors. And these have a power output of uh, 
what is it? It's a, I believe 10, is it 50 megawatts electric or less? I can't remember now if it's 10 or 50. Most of them are 10, they're 10 megawatts or less. And these are gonna be very important for providing independent power supply, say for a military base that wants to be, needs to be on an independent grid and have a very reliable source of power. So nuclear safety is coming into all of these reactors. Okay, so some of you are gonna tell me, well, hey, you're talking pretty highly there of nuclear power. What about Three Mile Island Unit 2? We had a core meltdown there. The fuel overheated and melted. Uh, yeah, we did. That was in 1979. And we had Chernobyl. That was in 1986. That was a Russian reactor that, um, well, that one kind of had a, the, they lost their containment. They didn't really have a containment. This one, Chernobyl, released a lot of radioactivity into the environment. Okay, and then there was Fukushima Daiichi in 2011. So over the history of our nuclear power, we've had three accidents in large reactors, two of them commercial, Chernobyl was a state reactor, where the fuel overheated, released radioactive fission products, um, but in the TMI-2, it was contained. In Chernobyl, we released, a lot of radioactivity was released to the public. And in Fukushima Daiichi, there was also a release of radioactivity. So we've had three accidents. I'll tell you the first one has been TMI-2, Three Mile Island Unit 2. That was in uh, New York. That, that's the US react, uh, accident. That one has been designed out of existence. It cannot happen again. They've redesigned equipment that failed and uh, contributed to the accident. We have better operator training. This, this one, Three Mile Island 2 will not be repeated. Chernobyl will not be repeated. That was due to human error. That was due to intentional violation of safety um, requirements. Um, I don't want to, it's hard to point fingers at anybody. Some, I think a lot of people didn't know what they were doing. They didn't understand the physics of the reactor and what could happen as a consequence of their actions. So this second one was, uh, that's, not repeatable because we have better um, number of reasons, better operator training, better oversight, and better international cooperation so that we don't have, the, the design itself had some flaws and uh, we don't have that, those flaws in our, in any reactor in the world at that point. And then Fukushima Daiichi, wow, that one we're looking at right now, that was caused by uh, tsunamis and earthquakes, earthquakes followed by tsunamis. Um, and that one we're looking at, um, we know why it happens and we're responding in all of our current operating reactors. So something similar could happen. Okay, so we have had three accidents, but it's an excellent safety record and uh, these accidents are not gonna happen again. Um, okay, so remember the definition of nuclear safety? Let's see about halfway through. Okay, that we're protecting the public's health against the release in uh, unlikely event of uh, release of radioactivity. Talk to you about how reactors are safe. In addition to designing and regulating and operating our reactors in a safe way, we also have what we call safety culture implemented into the industry and in all aspects of the nuclear sector. Okay, and um, so nu nuclear, uh, sorry, safety culture is a way of thinking. Okay, it's a way of um, acting always in the safe manner. If you see something question of, about the plant that might warrant the safety, it causes you to question the safety, you question it, you do raise the issue. So it's a way of thinking and it's um, involved in all the way from the managers down to the, the people who are actually operating the equipment, safety culture. Okay, and we also recognize there is risk in nuclear power. Okay, there's risk in everything. And what is risk? Risk is the frequency of something happening times its consequences. Okay, and um, I could go on and on about risk too. We have a lot of really interesting risk courses in the university if you're as engineers interested in taking them, I think we could recommend some of those. But uh, so the question is how safe is safe enough? Okay. We, we have, I believe we have a very high level of safety in our 
reactors, and that's measured by the frequency of core damage, core overheating, and it's also measured by release of radioactivity. Uh, but uh, you can't get to having no risk. And so how far do we, how safe do we have to make our reactors? That's a big question. How safe is safe enough? I have a very good paper back from 2001, but it still stands, talks about how safe is safe enough. And so we were always trying to make our reactors more safe, make, reduce the amount of radioactivity that anybody could possibly be exposed to. But if you want to do some reading on that, there's a really, uh, I, I really like the paper, NRCL, the Evolution of Safety Goals. And he talked, yeah, this Dr. Mazur talks about how safe is safe enough. We're getting close to zero. We'll never get to zero risk, but I think we're doing pretty good. And we have some ways of dealing with risk. I'm going to go to a chart here. What we do is we design our reactors so that we, we hypothesize the events that could happen. We hypothesize uh, you know, a loss of power so that we can't power our pumps and cool our reactor. We, we imagine these terrible things and uh, we evaluate them to see if our plants could handle them. This curve shows our concept of risk. So we hypothesize these events, the consequence, I'm sorry, the probability of them happening, or the frequency. The units here are per, year, per reactor year of operation. So 10 to the minus two means something would happen once every 100 years of reactor operation. 10 to the six, once every million years of reactor operation. And we take these events that we hypothesize and we evaluate the consequence. Well, what happens, forget the probability, say it does happen, what's the consequence? And we, we um, quantify the consequences. It can be in terms of radioactivity release or some other or financial, some other consequence. And what we do is we develop these risk curves. We multiply the frequency times the consequence. In which you and then you define how much risk you're willing to accept. What you want are events that are of low consequence, so to the left of this curve, and low probability. Okay, if it's if the events are low consequence, low probability, you're below whatever you set your risk curve as. What you don't want is a high probability, high consequence event. Okay, so we design, we identify the events that would have a high enough consequence or high enough probability to get above our risk curve, to be to the upper right here. And we design those out of our system so we're back down in, with an acceptable level of risk. I'll give you an example of what we're doing. We're looking at new fuels and it's, we're expecting this is a new fuel is gonna be in our reactors pretty soon. It's called accident tolerant fuel. And this comes out of, uh, it was inspired a lot by the Fukushima accidents in 2011. If we can redesign our fuel so that it cannot fail, it cannot release radioactivity, well then a nuclear accident is not such a big deal anymore. It's just like a, a, a typical industrial accident. If there's no radioactivity involved. So what we're doing is we're redesigning our fuel so that it has a higher, uh, for you mechanical engineers and nuclear engineers, it has a higher thermal conductivity, then it, does, it can pass the heat out, the fission heat out, without heating up as much. And we're also we're making other changes to the fuel, such as um, having it more structurally stable at high temperatures and some other um, features to it. Uh, so we're, we've already got some of this test fuel, the accident tolerant fuel, we've already got some of it in current operating reactors and we're testing it out. And we're hoping to have a full core loading. We're hoping to have the first core of a nuclear core of a reactor with accident tolerant fuel in about five, six years from now. Okay, so that's one, even though our, we think our reactors are pretty safe, but we think we can always do better. So accident tolerant fuel is a big move for us right now. And um, we're also moving to new reactor designs. We're designing some reactors that are cooled by other materials, such as a high temperature gas, hydrogen, uh, helium. We're, we're designing helium reactors. They can get up to higher temperatures. And what's really nice about that is they can 
provide the heat for high temperature chemical reactions such as hydrogen production. And we also have uh, other coolants we're looking at, molten salt reactors, molten chlorides. Uh, I told you we're already looking at smaller reactors, small modular reactors and micro reactors for military bases or smaller applications. And uh, these are all, all these new reactors have even higher safety bars than our current reactors. Uh, let's see, I've gone on for 30 minutes now. So let me tell you a little bit about my research. So again, I'm, I'm about nuclear safety. I have a laboratory, I call it the Nuclear Heat Transfer Laboratory. And I'm working on rea studying reactor safety systems, looking at their designs and either modifying them or taking an existing design. Right now I have a lot of work with the boiling water reactors because we found that there's a safety system that worked really well during the Fukushima accident. And we didn't know what its capabilities were. It did a lot more to cool the core than we thought it could. And we have this system in 25 of our US boiling water reactors. So we're, we're seeing what we can do with it here too. And maybe we are underestimating the, the capabilities of this system. And our reactors are even safer than we thought they were. Um, and I also, um, I do my work with students. I have very few postdocs research engineers. We're, we're mostly students and me in the lab. Um, I do a lot of experimental work and I also do analytical work. Yeah. So uh, my objectives, I already said that, develop and promote new reactor designs and safety systems. And I also work with some fundamental two-phase flow phenomenon. I work with condensation heat transfer, looking at how uh, to design heat exchangers to better, more efficiently condense steam. That's part of, we need that in some of our reactor safety systems. And I also look at two-phase flow um, in terms of uh, steam and water flow. We have a lot of steam, obviously, in reactors. And I look a lot at the, the flow characteristics. So um, what we're looking at is uh, my goals. I have a continuously funded lab experimental laboratory. And the major equipment I'm going to say here, are, I have a big steam supply. It's 157 kilowatts. That's very large for a university. And it, it lets me do steam water experiments, whereas a lot of my colleagues will do air water experiments and apply that to nuclear systems. But I'm, I'm willing to, to stand at the edge of the, <laughs> whatever it is, and, and do steam water experiments. It involves more safety. I work a lot with my students to keep everybody safe because we're working with high temperatures and, and uh, steam can be uh, harder to work with um, than air. And that allows, we also work at elevated pressures. There are some people who work with steam at atmospheric pressure, but we've got uh, my systems tight so that I can pressurize them up to about four or five atmospheres. And you know, I do a lot for two phase phenomenon, steam, mostly steam water and nuclear reactors. And um, with this, a lot of this work I've been doing the last couple of years, we've gotten into turbo machinery. I work a lot with the turbo lab in mechanical engineering. Um, because we're looking at the steam turbines. And for those of you familiar with turbines, we are um, looking at, we inject steam in the turbines and we also inject steam water mixtures. And we're looking at how well a particular turbine design in a BWR safety system operates when you have steam and water going into it. The turbines don't like water. They want dry steam or gas. They don't want, want moisture in it. But, uh, we have a turbine design that uh, is in power plants and it, it's willing to accept water. So I've gotten myself into turbo machinery. I'll show you that too. I have three basic emphasis. I'm looking at long-term cooling of the nuclear reactor core when the power plant does not have AC power. They've lost the grid for some reason. That happened in Fukushima. They were without the grid, the electric grid for several weeks. And so I'm looking at how we can get these systems to operate without power. I'm also looking at um, countercurrent flow limitation. That's where you have two phase flow, um, flow, two fluids going in different directions and looking at how stable or unstable the flows are. And I also do analysis. Well, we collect data and analyze all of it from our experiments, but I also do uh, model, accident modeling of reactors under hypothetical scenarios where they're overheating. 
And that involves, I, I use a reactor safety code from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. It's developed at Sandia National Lab. So I work with Sandia a lot on modeling. So we're, we're looking there at melt, melting the fuel. I don't have any nuclear fuel in my lab. I have electric heaters, but analytically I'll melt the fuel, watch where the fission products go. All right, so let me show you what, I'm, I'm gonna give you a lab tour by video and I'll show you what we're looking at. I have a steam generator. My steam generator is my nuclear reactor. Again, I'm using electrically heated heaters. I have no nuclear fuel in here, but I, I produce my steam and the system we're looking at produces steam. It sends it, the steam over to a turbine. The turbine powers a pump and, and the pump returns water back to the um, reactor core to keep the core cool. This system is called the reactor core isolation cooling system. The, we call it the RICSI system. And the RICSI operates when you've, um, you've shut off the fission reaction. So you're not, you're looking at decay heat. You're not looking at fission heat anymore, but decay heat is still on the order of megawatts. You need to remove that heat to keep the core cool. And we're looking under the conditions where we've lost AC power. We've lost the grid and on-site power. And what's really cool about this system is that, well, that there's decay heat coming out of the core. That's not cool at all, but the heat comes out. And what you're using is you use that heat to boil water. The water goes to the turbine. The turbine powers the pump. And that, that heat that's being produced in the core is actually used to return water back and cool itself. So that's what we're, we're interested in is this RICSI system. We're looking at under what conditions it can operate. And I mentioned the turbine. If you have lost your power on the grid and on-site power, you don't have uh, any power to regulate the turbine speed. What we're gonna have, or the water level in the core, what we're gonna have is wet steam, steam with water droplets coming into this turbine. So it's a steam water mixture coming into the turbine. And that's one of my main emphases is looking at that. So let me show you a video of my lab. I'm gonna start my video now. All right, so I have just a, a few more slides and to show you so uh, we can get all this data I mean we'd love to do experiments but we also want to use our data so uh, we've got some turbine experiments that are um, with the turbine what do we get out of the turbine I'll show you for example we measure the the turbine speed the rate at which the shaft turns and that, that's our turbine rotational speed and we plot the torque against that and what we've done is we've, we've gotten some data at a number of different pressures. And here now I'm in metric units. And <clears throat> the, what I'm showing you here is air water data that's been published. We did air water, injected air water mixtures into that turbine that I could carry turbine I showed you in the video and plotted these data. And um, so you see the family of curves, each curve is for a different pressure. And then, um, and then we wanted to look at the, uh, to evaluate these data in a more convenient form. And so we, um, we use the turbine, they're called turbine affinity laws. They're, they're basic laws that describe how the turbine works. Okay, and you, you get a dimensionless parameter that looks at the flow rate, you get a dimensionless parameter that looks at the turbine output power. So torque is what we measure. And what we did then was we, we were looking at two phase data we modified these affinity laws to account for having water in our gas flow. Mm -hmm. And um, so we, um, we use these modified parameters. Sorry, there's the, the output, um, let's see, there's a head coefficient. We're looking at these dimensionless P and psi. And, um, what we did was we plotted these data, the flow coefficient and the power output our power output coefficient on the y-axis for different two-phase uh, mixtures. And I've got the, the legend up here, the, um, 
M sub A is the air mass fraction. 1.0 is all air. 0 0.05 is the quality, 0 0.05 quality of air in an air water mixture. And we uh, were able to um, have these two phase curves collapse into a single curve if we used a, a correction to account for the two phase flow. So this is our dimensionless analysis. And this data then is being used by the nuclear industry to evaluate their steam turbines when they have water going in, into them. Now they can get a better handle on how their steam turbines would perform if they have a steam water mixture going into them. And I told you, I'm also doing a lot on turbo machinery. And uh, here's a, an example of the larger turbine I have. I, in the video, I showed you a smaller turbine. This turbine that I'm showing you here in this picture is on loan to us from a nuclear power plant. They use it as a trainer um, to train their people on. It, it won't ever be hooked up to a steam line. And so this is a full-size turbine. <clears throat> and what we're doing is we're, we're doing some bearing studies on it. You have bearings the kind of float the turbine on the shaft, the shaft goes through here and there are bearings on either side of the turbine that allow this, the uh, turbine to spin freely. And we don't have enough steam to, or air to, to make this turbine rotate. We have to use a motor, so I have a good size motor. And we're looking at the bearings. These are the bearings, the silver thing here, and this is the bottom half of the bearing. This is the top. If you take this top off, we use the bottom half. And what we're looking at is um, they want us to heat the oil, the, the lubricating oil, so that it's not as viscous and see how well the turbine works. And uh, we've been doing that. We've been measuring the torque as a function of time with heated oil. And, um, and right now, we've just gotten that data. Um, and so I could go on and on. I could show you a video of a flow limitation if you want, two phase video. I'm not sure that uh, you'd like me to do on time, but um, I could show you it's like a one, two minute video, or I can stop here and take questions, whatever you like. <laughs>